Chris, uh, take it away. Thank you. And how long do I have? You have 15 minutes. Oh, Chris. So, I want to talk to you guys today about uh, the importance of the jury. And when I left here, I went to uh, go back to down to Louisiana, and I was going to work for plaintiffs. Uh, but a friend of mine is a, a defense lawyer. He's got a large firm, and he uh, he convinced me to come work with him. So I did defense work for a year and a half with him, and then I moved back here, and I'm a plaintiff's lawyer again. Uh, and the importance of a jury is something we all take for granted. And so I wanted to first start by sort of seeing if anybody would, would sort of play along here. Uh, and, and, you know, I think probably the most well-read person I know and the most politically active I know is Jim Crowder. Jim, can you think of anything wrong with the jury system today? <coughs> as, as you know, or, or uh, you know, in your opinion, is there anything really wrong well, with the jury? Um, the kind of broad definition of peers Okay. As any jury of your peers right. would be a one of your current jury system. Um, and, and, and as much as the original design of the system was uh, thought of. Okay. Um, otherwise, I think the biggest failure of it is lack of participation of citizens. Fantastic. That's the perfect way to start. So, let's assume that. Uh, we're all lawyers here. This is one big law firm. And we're meeting this morning to decide whether or not to take a case. And we have a case that involves a laborer at the Texaco refinery. And if you're a laborer at the Texaco refinery in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, your job was the lowest job there was. You picked up trash, you cleaned toilets. And one of the things that you did was you cleaned up asbestos after the pipe fitters came across the top of where you walked and they laid asbestos in the pipes. You swept up all the dust, you, you emptied that dust into bins, and you did this, in the case of one of my clients, for 40 years. What do you think the chance would be if you had a lawsuit against Exxon when Rex Tillerson was in charge of Exxon, multinational corporation, and you're in Port Arthur, Texas, you're dying, literally, you're on your deathbed, um, and your only complaint to your lawyer has nothing to do with how much money you might collect. You don't have a money problem, in your words, you have a time <coughs> problem. Does anybody, let's have a show of hands. You're, you're the law firm. If there is no jury, what are, what are the chances that we're going to get anything out of Exxon without the threat of a jury trial? Just a show of hands. Does anybody think that we have a chance of winning some money from Exxon with no, no chance of a jury trial? No? You think you're nodding no? Correct. You don't think there's a chance? Correct. I, I agree with you. I truly do. Does anybody think there is a chance with no jury? And don't be afraid to, to say you think there's a chance. Interior, I think there's a chance. Okay, so there'd be a judge. So chance, chance, mm -hmm. chance. We got three or four or five. Okay, what if I tell you that in Port Arthur, Texas, it was all Democratic judges <coughs> when I first got there in 1987. And by the time I left there in 2008, they were all Republican judges. Does that change anybody's mind on the chance that you would have had when I first got there, all Democratic judges, when I left, all Republican judges. Anybody think that makes a difference on whether I was How many hands? So most, most of the people here, okay? You know, juries actually change too over time, but they change slower. And in Tex Texas, we had a right to a 12 person jury, either in federal or state court. So at least you had 12 different people, and you had a panel larger than this that would come into the room and you got to ask everybody. You got to find out more about Darren and more about Brent. You could go through and talk to people about their prejudices and their thoughts and do it in panel 12. Both sides got to do that. I, I think that was very important. Okay, Let me give you another example real quick. Um, I'm not watching the time, but I'm going to abbreviate this. Uh, Home Depot. There were uh, workers in a Home Depot and they were stocking at about 7 o'clock at night, and they had closed the shelf down in the aisle where they were stocking. They were using a forklift, and they were 
loading things at the very top of the of the shelf in Home Depot. It, has everyone been in Home Depot? Mm -hmm. You know, the shelves go on as high as a warehouse used to. And there used to be a sign at Sears if you wanted to go into the warehouse area or into the area where the mechanics work, <coughs> that no uh, customers were allowed back there. The actual the brilliance of Home Depot, the reason they exploded was that was new. That had never happened before that you could go into a warehouse. And we all went in there and <coughs> looked at the, the shelves stocked to the ceiling and just thought, wow, this is so cool. What we didn't know was the reason that Sears insisted that no one ever go into the warehouse or into the automotive area was there's a danger of falling objects. So we have a new client. Again, we're a law firm. And we have a new client, and he, and he comes to us, and he says, I was shopping at Home Depot. How long do I have to? Uh, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Uh, we have a new client, this, this law firm. I'm suggesting that we take him on. Uh, he was in Home Depot, and on the opposite shelf, I mean, on the opposite aisle that had been closed, they were stocking, and there is no divider in the uh, shelves at Home Depot between the aisles. And the reason there's no divider is Bernie Marcus made that decision himself. He's one of the heads of Home Depot, one of the two founders. He didn't want a divider. He wanted to be able to stock as much as he needed for either aisle. There's still no divider in the top shelf of the Home Depot. Um, so, as they're restocking, they push a 68-pound drill press, and it falls from the very top shelf, almost, uh, I think it was 13 and a half feet, and it hits the six-foot man on the top of his head. Okay. Does everybody think we should take that case if we can't get a jury? If we cannot. We cannot get a jury. It's going to be a judge trial. We, is everybody still okay with taking the case? Yeah, take the case, yeah. How about if I tell you that this man is an astronaut, and this has knocked him out of the space program. Everybody still want to take the case? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. What if I tell you that the judge that's going to try the cases in Galveston, <laughs> and I'm clairvoyant, and I can tell you that within one year, he's going to be one of the few federal judges ever impeached for being so biased that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal takes his judgeship away from him, takes all of his cases away from him, and, and he is literally impeached and he's in prison today. Does anybody think we should still take this case? Yes. No. Still, still think it's good, right? Yeah. Even though we're going to go in front of this biased judge, okay? And what I'm going to tell you, we take the case, and we're just, we're just kicking ass and taking names, to, to use the, the current expression. Everything's going wonderful until the Home Depot lawyer figures out that if he hires local counsel, the judge's best friend, it'll switch everything. And he does that. And this morning, I just got back from a hearing, and the judge has done a 360. And he's insisting that we go mediate the case, and he's telling us that we're not even going to get a trial. And he is, he, is, he is demanded that I turn over all of the second set of books that Home Depot uh, keeps on all of the falls that they, they know about that have happened in their stores. They literally have two sets of books on this. Wow. Uh, does anybody think maybe we should start thinking about settling this case? Yes. Yeah. That's what happened. The judge was that prejudiced. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to have a good friend who's uh, father's on the Fifth Circuit and to be able to talk to three Fifth Circuit judges about what happened to me, and as were a bunch of other lawyers in Houston, because in every case there are two sides, and in every case there's usually two sides that are well represented, and they too have contacts with other people. Mm -hmm. So this judge was eliminated because of his bias, and wow. he literally is in prison. Uh, not, not because of bias, he's in prison for, for assaulting his... his does, it get re, does it get retried now? The, the case was actually resolved because we, we had a trial and we had no other choice, but the money was so high that the client wanted to take it. it um, uh, five more minutes, Dan? Five more minutes. Okay. Mm. I'm going to just do one more. You all want to hear about DuPont or Texaco? Texaco. Texaco. Okay. So uh, there's a man named Mr. Womack, and uh, his nickname was Nubby. And uh, I don't know why, but uh, he was actually a pipe fitter. And he was a pipe fitter at Texaco. And he was the man that actually put the asbestos on the pipes. He was not the guy that had to clean up the trash. But the pipe fitters ate by themselves because they were better than the laborers and, and they, were, they were just a different group. And I'll be honest with you, most of the pipe fitters in the 40s and 50s were white and most of the laborers were black. And it was a tough place to work uh, if you were a laborer. But it wasn't 
it's so hot if you were a pipe fitter either. You spent all day putting up asbestos. One of the asbestos uh, products that they used was a magnesia sort of blend. And that was what they covered the outside of the pipe with. And Nubby uh, had his left lung removed on Easter Day, uh, about uh, probably 2007, 2008. Uh, and only six months later, he's given his deposition. He was 91 years old uh, with no left lung. He had mesothelioma, which is directly related to asbestos. Um, and uh, poor Nubby is, is, is there in this room, and, and there's probably this many people, each representing a separate company that we were suing for asbestos exposure. Uh, we knew that we were going to have a jury, but Texaco, his employer, was the first place that mesothelioma had ever been uh, uh, diagnosed and by any doctor. And, and today, mesothelioma is known all over the world as being related to Texaco. I mean, being related to asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, though, we also had 12 other clients. And we were uh, about to pick a jury. And the morning that we were about to pick the jury was the first time Texaco ever made an offer in that case. And it settled for, in my opinion, way more than we could have ever gotten from a judge. Um, I won't tell you the rest of the jury part of that story. Let me, let me tell you how important juries are, just probably about three minutes. This is what our founding fathers thought about the importance of a jury trial. And, and I want everyone to kind of read along with me on these quotes. These are three different people. First of all, what chance do you think you would have going up against any of these companies without a lawyer? Does anybody, we're a law firm, yeah, you think anybody that I just talked about has a chance of winning one of these cases? Everybody says zero? zero. Okay. And then, what chance do you think your lawyer would have without the right to trial by jury? I can tell you, I promise you, it would be zero. Uh, you, you just, you're not going to get justice in this world right now unless you have the right to pick 12 people who aren't in the business, who haven't been appointed, who don't have any, any political leanings, who can actually look at your case. And I agree with you, I really do, that the thought of a peer is uh, probably abused a little bit. But you know what, we have a more uh, <coughs> society today than we did when the founders uh, came up with this idea for us. Uh, and, and in today's world, everybody has a right to speak up. And everybody <coughs> listens to everyone else more than they used to. So there aren't any more laborers and pipe fitters that are just either white or black. Um, in fact, everybody in, in Port Arthur, Texas can have any job at a refinery, and that really does happen. Here's, here's the first quote. Well, my opinion about the first thing, could you make it without a lawyer or without a jury? The chances are pretty damn slim. <laughs> Our founding fathers demanded the sanctity of jury trial be protected and not interfered with. Thomas Jefferson in 1788 said, I consider trial by jury as the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which government can be held to the principles of its constitution. Mm -hmm. You know, these, these men, they, they spent the majority of their adult lives thinking about how to set up a government that would work for us. And we should really be proud of the fact that we have the jury system. That, that is central to the government. James Madison, 1789, in suits at common law, trial by jury in civil cases is essential to secure the liberty of the people as any one of the pre-existent rights of nature. In other words, that, that, he felt this was a core principle. The only way that we were going to have our rights was to have a jury trial. And this is probably the most flamboyant, and this is the last quote I'm just about to throw. John Adams, representative government and trial by jury are the heart and lungs of liberty. Without them, we have no other fortification against being ridden like horses, fleeced like sheep, worked like cattle, and fed and clothed like swine and hounds. 1774. So everybody, when you <coughs> think about big companies, at least for the next week or so, try to think about the fact that you or any of your loved ones, or the guy that, that rakes your garden, or, or build the, the guys that help roof your house, any one of those people has the right to go up against Home Depot, or Exxon, or any other multinational company 
if they're truly and honestly wrong. And it, it is a, a powerful system that we have. We should all be really proud of it. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks.